Welcome back to 12 Days in March. This special edition of the Year in Review features actual cases from my clinical practice. In this case, we'll discuss a patient who presented with anemia. As with all presentations, a PDF of this recording is available at the website. I am also happy to announce that 12 Days is now offering tutorial services. For those interested, details are available at the website. This series offers three sequential questions. Please pause the recording to analyze our first question. And here is question number two. And finally, question number three. Good luck. Showtime. Let's begin our review. The patient in this vignette is referred for video capsule endoscopy. The first question to answer is what is the usual indication for capsule endoscopy? Answer, GI bleeding of unknown origin. Once you realize the basis of the study, it is easy to answer the question. Even if you didn't know the indication, this then describes the finding that is shown in the graphic. So this is the second case in our urine review series, and we are two for two. Another example where the graphic offers little information above and beyond what is described in the stem. And now the derivative questions. Which of the following are consistent with GI blood loss? So let's analyze our options, and these are the major teaching points of the first question. The first choice reveals a low MCV, or microcytosis. When you see a low MCV, your short list includes iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease, and perhaps thalassemia, but not in a case with GI bleeding. I list sideroblastic anemia for completeness. Before advancing on this brief discussion, be aware this topic is addressed in excruciating, painful detail in a separate 12 days recording. Returning to the discussion, the patient has a low iron. This can be seen in iron deficiency anemia or anemia of chronic disease. In iron deficiency anemia, the low iron is typically from loss of iron to the outside world as seen in GI or GYN bleeding. On the boards, it would be unusual to see iron deficiency from poor nutrition. Typically, however, they do use iron deficiency to underscore malabsorption, with celiac disease being a classic example. In the anemia of chronic disease, I've simplified a complex multifactorial etiology into a single mechanism, that being IL-1 release. It is an easy and efficient way to think about anemia of chronic disease. IL-1 leads to increased hepcidin levels, causing iron to become trapped inside cells. That is, iron is not available in the general circulation. IL-1 concurrently suppresses release of erythropoietin. These are two pretty good mechanisms to induce anemia. Great news for you! There's more! Anemia of chronic disease is associated with a decrease in iron binding capacity. What the hell does that mean? In anemia of chronic disease, the body synthesizes less transferrin. Less transferrin means fewer binding sites for iron, thus the lower binding capacity. So whereas there is less iron, there is also less transferrin, and this is expressed by a low iron binding capacity. Like I said, this is discussed in a separate video. Our next choice reveals an elevated MCV, and you are given a low B12 plus antibody against intrinsic factor. Straightforward. This is the hallmark of autoimmune gastritis. The two derivatives you should have at the ready for autoimmune gastritis include 1. This is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. In this condition, antibody is directed against fixed tissue, and that tissue is the parietal cell. Although I list intrinsic factor antibody, there is also antibody directed against the parietal cell. Loss of parietal cell function explains the second key derivative. Autoimmune gastritis is complicated by adenocarcinoma of the stomach. As a result of damaged parietal cells, gastrin levels are elevated trying to ramp up acid secretion. No parietal cells means no acid. The gastrin, which is a trophic hormone, just keeps coming. Eventually, in the setting of a chronically elevated stimulatory factor like gastrin, mutations occur giving rise to gastric cancer. Moving along, Choice 4 revealed a normocytic anemia and elevated indirect bilirubin. This is a classic description for hemolysis. 
Hemolysis would have nothing to do with the aphthate that had been previously viewed. Further, the stem doesn't offer clues that suggest an underlying hemolytic disorder. And that brings us to the last and correct answer. The patient had a capsule endoscopy study to evaluate his iron deficiency anemia. Both endoscopy and colonoscopy were previously normal. Bleeding was discovered in the small intestine. Insofar as the elevated iron binding capacity, patients with iron deficiency ramp up transferrin synthesis. So there is more transferrin available and less iron to bind to it. Thus, with iron deficiency anemia, you have a high iron binding capacity. That is, lots of transferrin just waiting to transport iron. Depicted is also the classic low iron saturation, which is simply a calculation of iron divided by iron binding capacity. Well, Sachs beat that one to death, but I think students struggle with interpreting iron studies. Okay, in question two, they ask you to determine the pathology present if you biopsy an aphthous lesion. Choice A describes crypt abscess with neutrophilic infiltrate. This is the classic pathologic description of ulcerative colitis. I like to refer to ulcerative colitis as neutrophilic colitis as it describes the pathology and readily distinguishes the entity from granulomatous colitis or Crohn's disease. And here is the quick summary. Ulcerative colitis characterized by continuous involvement spreading from the anorectal region more proximally. You would not expect to see isolated lesions in the small bowel. By the very name, ulcerative colitis means ulcers in the colon. And finally, the macroscopic appearance would not include aphthe. The typical description would be friable mucosa with inflammatory pseudopolyps. And just a reminder, pseudopolyps are actually surviving remnants of the inflammatory process. They represent normal mucosa surrounded by those crypt abscesses. Choice 3 includes the description of a thin-walled vessel lined by epithelium and scant smooth muscle. This is the description of an AVM. Not to beat it to death like I do everything else, but I love this description. Reading from the slide, these vascular channels may be separated from the intestinal lumen only by the vascular wall and a layer of attenuated epithelial cells. Who the hell would want a vascular channel protected by an epithelial cell? That's a recipe for disaster. Throw that patient onto Warfarin or Plavix and you have a hot GI bleed. I included a picture of an alveolus because that's how delicate these things are. The last two options refer to adenocarcinoma, which would not present with aphthe. Listed also are two of the hereditary colorectal syndromes. You do need to be familiar with this material, but it is not this day. All right, I stole that line from Aragorn at the Black Gate of Mordor. Friends, there may come a time, but it is not this day. And that leads to the correct answer for question number two. Granulomatous infiltrate with transmural inflammation. We can argue whether aphthe would be associated with transmural inflammation, but aphthe are most assuredly an early manifestation of Crohn's and best fit with this presentation. In terms of commonly quoted take-homes, the terminal ileum is most commonly involved, followed by iliocolonic disease. And to this point, aphthous lesions are noted in the proximal ileum. More importantly, and unlike ulcerative colitis, granulomatous colitis is associated with skip lesions. That's exactly what we're seeing here, two isolated inflammatory lesions. Ulcerative colitis is characterized by continuous involvement. So now we've established a diagnosis of granulomatous colitis. Before moving on, I would encourage you to know the cells and cytokines involved in granuloma formation. You should know them like the back of your hand. So I just took a picture of the back of my hand. It looks stupid, and I don't really know it that well. And finally, moving on to my favorite question, the Crohn's derivatives. Answering this question required a couple of steps. The first step was establishing the diagnosis. On the boards, they assume you can do that. Then they launch the questions on complications and extraintestinal manifestations. That's great fun for them. You make a GI diagnosis, and then they wander. One of the favorite places for them to wander is to fistulae. The problem is they don't show pictures, not that they would help. So sometimes the fistulae are obvious, as in a patient has abdominal pain with chronic diarrhea and now develops an anal fistula. That is classic. We are done. Diagnosis is Crohn's, and you can expect a granuloma derivative. Likewise, a patient can be described that literally has crap draining through their skin. Done. Diagnosis is Crohn's. They will ask you a granuloma derivative. The tricky one is when they put air, stool, or microbes in the bladder or out the vagina. No student ever recognized these. Bottom line, in a case that smells like Crohn's, 
be on the lookout for fish delay and derivatives. Now, where was I? Oh yeah, the question focuses on complications and extraintestinal manifestations. So the first image is a big dilated colon. It was meant to represent toxic megacolon. This is a complication associated with ulcerative colitis. To be sure, you can't make the diagnosis on image alone. The buzzword is toxic. They are sick as hell. They would have to describe a toxic patient with history of diarrhea, and then they show this image. The question that would follow this image addresses the underlying cause. Answer, ulcerative colitis. We can certainly see toxic megacolon in other conditions, such as C. diff, but they would need to give distinguishing features, such as recent antibiotic use. Choice C is sporadic colorectal cancer. It is sporadic because of the early APC mutation. This is typical of the adenoma carcinoma sequence that you will need to be familiar with for the boards. Here in this slide, I demonstrate characteristics of colorectal cancer complicating inflammatory bowel disease. The classic change is the APC mutation flip-flopping with P53. So P53 would be identified as the early mutation if the question writer wanted the tumor to complicate inflammatory bowel disease. Insofar as colorectal cancer in inflammatory bowel disease, it more typically complicates ulcerative colitis, and especially those with long-standing pan colitis. The patients tend to be younger, the tumors are located more proximally, and tend to be multifocal. So colorectal cancer was not a bad choice, but the early APC mutation was the clue that this is a sporadically formed tumor. Moving on to choice C. We have a patient with inflammatory bowel disease and a cholangiogram. Cholangiography in a patient with IBD equals sclerosing cholangitis. Primary sclerosing cholangitis typically complicates ulcerative colitis. It is characterized by intra and extrahepatic beating and the classic description of onion skin fibrosis. This topic is reviewed in my worthless podcast on intrahepatic cholestasis, but regardless, be sure to link primary sclerosing cholangitis and ulcerative colitis. And here is the summary before bringing it home. A is toxic megacolon, typically associated with ulcerative colitis. C is sporadic colorectal cancer. And D is sclerosing cholangitis, also associated with ulcerative colitis. Here is choice B, the correct answer. The option shows a film with blurring of the right SI joint. You need to be familiar with sacroiliitis and its association with inflammatory bowel disease, and Crohn's in particular. It may be seen in ulcerative colitis, but less commonly, and furthermore, we knew this patient had granulomatous colitis. Do note, they can describe the manifestations of inflammatory back pain as listed. So they may not tell you sacroiliitis, but it can be implied by those symptoms. So in this question, sacroiliitis was the most likely epiphenomenon associated with his diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Here are the other common associations that you should have at the ready with Crohn's. These include steatorrhea, derm manifestations, and loss of terminal ileum function. Again, you should be familiar with the language used to describe these manifestations. For instance, they won't say low B12. Rather, they'll describe a patient with loss of vibratory sensation or elevation of methylmalonic acid level. They are all topics for another day. So I know these questions definitely had some loose associations, but the teaching points are spot on. You need to get in the habit of making good and almost automatic associations. They will carry you far on test day. I hope you enjoyed case two in this series. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.